Gary. I will call the first licensing hearings and public safety committee to order at 4.30. Uh, roll call, Alder Peterson. Here. Alder Heideman. Here. Alder Perella. Here. Alder Russ is here, and Alder Lafave is excused. So please join me in this pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All righty, we'll do a quick introduction of everybody. Me, members, staff, and guests. I'm Alder Russ, District 8 and Chair. I'm Grazia Pepeila, District 7. Uh, Joe Heidemann, uh, the Greater South Side, District 10. <laughs> Dan Peterson, District 3. Oh, Attorney Joseph Thurmer, or Jessica Bombard. Jessica Bombard Kinch. Chris Hunick, Licensed Professional Counselor, Substance Abuse Counselor, here for Jessica. Jeremy Burgard. Grant Polly, Three Sheeps Brew. Kathy Hoffman from the Attorney's Office. Darcy Biernink with the City Clerk's Office. Uh, Meredith Bruin, City Clerk. <laughs> Eric Macchiano, Fire Chief. Lieutenant Matthew Walsh, Morgan Police. Dave Netting, Hyper Lights, here for Terry Schulist. Terry Schulist, here to appeal my license decision. Chuck Adams, City Attorney. All righty. Looking for approval of the minutes. Move to approve. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Minutes are approved. All right, item number six, presentation to the committee by the city attorney's office, city's clerk's, city clerk's office, and the Sheboygan Police Department. So I'll start, this being the first meeting of the new licensing year, and many of you being, many, but not all of you being new uh, to this uh, committee, um, this is a presentation we give nearly every year, uh, but I'll kind of walk through it a little bit more in detail than years when everybody's sort of repeat members. So starting a little bit, just general duties of this committee, the licensing hearings and public safety committee. Uh, this committee generally deals uh, with any licensing matters, uh, any matters that, have, uh, that are deemed related to public safety, although there are a few exceptions. Uh, the police department, fire department, building inspection department, and city attorney's office report to this committee as their home committee. Um, and so you will see quarterly and uh, uh, quarterly reports from the PD and fire department annual reports uh, from the others for your information. Uh, one of the, and a lot of the stuff I have in front of you so you can keep this information so that you have it uh, going forward. Uh, the key mission of this committee is, is what's spelled out in the municipal code that you hear all quasi-judicial hearings. Uh, most of them relate to licensing, but they can deal with other issues as well. Um, uh, we, uh, one of the common ones, well, more lately, lately we've had several dangerous dog hearings, and those can take a long time. Park impact fees, we haven't had one of those in a while, but that, that, can, that can come here. Um, some of those quasi-judicial hearings are more formal than others. Some of them are rather formal because there's a very specific requirement for how uh, they're held, others are a little more informal. Uh, this committee also generally deals with uh, code uh, changes that aren't specifically related to public works or finance or human resources. And this is the committee that's been designated to consider and make recommendations regarding matters that are referred to the city's ethics board. One of the, the big issues, and it's not as big anymore as it used to be, uh, that this uh, committee deals with is liquor licensing. The reason it's not as big as it used to be is that the, the state uh, several years ago um, allowed cities to delegate the authority to grant most licenses to the clerk. And uh, you uh, passed an ordinance that, that provided for that. So at this point, instead of hearing every license application as you used to, uh, you're only hearing those that, that are on appeal or those that there isn't the authority to have the clerk uh, make those decisions, which there are some. Uh, so, but just so that you're aware, a little bit of some of the issues around uh, liquor licensing. First of all, there's beverage operators licenses. Those are what people often refer to as bartenders licenses. Uh, anybody who serves liquor has to have this kind of a license. Uh, there are some exceptions, non-licensed people who are being directly supervised by a licensed bartender. You know, they're right there looking over their shoulder, watching what they're doing. 
uh, th those people are not uh, required to be licensed. Uh, the other except the other primary exception, although we don't typically do this because of uh, potential insurance issues, but city employees or uh, or officers of the city who are working at a city event where only city employees or officers are working and all proceeds are going to the city. No liquor license is, is needed, no beverage operator license is needed for that. So then who is eligible uh, for these bartenders licenses? In order to be eligible under the statute, a person must have no arrest or conviction record, but that requirement that they have no arrest or conviction record is subject to the Wisconsin Fair Employment Act. And there is additionally uh, a provision where, in essence, uh, applicants get one free conviction that doesn't count uh, against their license for either providing to underage, licensee, fail, uh, licensee sale to underage, failing to prevent underage alcohol consumption possession, or intentionally encouraging or contributing to underage alcohol consumption. Uh, and that's one per year. Uh, they also have to be over 18, and they also have to have taken the responsible beverage service training course. There's a few exceptions to that, but they're really not very relevant to you. So what does this mean that uh, to be eligible, a person must have no arrest or conviction record, but this requirement is subject to the Wisconsin Fair Employment Act? Well, Wisconsin Fair Employment Act says that you can't consider convictions that are unrelated to licensed activity. Now, what does that mean? That what convictions are related to license activity is not always a black and white issue. It's, you can't just say, if it's a conviction of this charge, it is related. If it is a conviction of this charge, it isn't related. It's, it's not quite as simple as that. And you often have to look at what are, what are the circumstances, what, uh, you know, how, how did it happen? Uh, what was the nature of the violation? Uh, as an example, we are often, even though, you know, even though we are very much opposed to domestic violence, where someone's record of, of violations is very clearly only domestic violence occurring in the home, um, that is often something that we will consider and make it more likely that somebody's going to be issued one of these kinds of licenses, because that is not something that you know, necessarily carries over into a tavern. However, uh, if, you, if you have people who have various types of law violations and they're sort of regularly um, uncooperative with law enforcement, um, you know, really basically giving officers a hard time, it may not be directly alcohol related, but because part of the role of uh, a bartender is going to be to work with the police on these issues, um, that is an issue that, that is, can often be uh, considered. Licenses that the city issues are, are valid only in the city. Uh, licenses issued by other municipalities are not valid in the city of Sheboygan. Uh, there is now a new uh, provision that hasn't been fully implemented where the state may also be issuing some licenses, but that, that, that was some recent legislation that is not fully implemented yet. These are licenses, these beverage operators licenses are licenses that the clerk has the authority to issue. And the way that our process works here at, at the city is that uh, two days before this meeting, uh, there is a staff committee made up of representatives from the clerk's office, uh, my office, and the police department who meet and talk about the various applications, review. Uh, we've, we've reviewed um, background checks. We've reviewed uh, police information. Uh, we've uh, often, if, if there are um, records that, that are concerning. We're actually looking at police reports and things like that uh, to uh, try to help the clerk to make a decision. Uh, the clerk then makes that decision, and uh, if someone uh, doesn't like that decision, uh, they, they have the ability to appeal that uh, here. And so you would have to sit in judgment uh, and make a, a decision. Uh, alcohol beverage licenses. There's a number of different kinds of licenses. I've listed them there. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's one of these things, it's, it's, it's interesting, even where the quotes are put makes a difference as to what kind of licenses there are. Uh, but typically you've got uh, class A beer and liquor licenses, class B beer and liquor licenses, and class C wine licenses. There is also now a cider only uh, license as well that is typically um, given along with a, a beer. Um, 
The Class A licenses, whether they're beer or liquor, are typically uh, for uh, generally uh, selling alcoholic beverages in original containers for off-premise consumption. So we're, we're talking about things like mini marts and, and things like that, or uh, liquor stores where it's, it's actually liquor. Um, Class B licenses are, are sort of the more, um, you know, this is sort of your uh, bar, restaurant, tavern type, type of license. Uh, these licenses allow the sale uh, of liquor or, or beer, depending on the license, uh, primarily for on-premises uh, consumption. Uh, although uh, there is a limited amount of sales for off-premises use uh, allowed for those kinds of licenses. There is a quota uh, that limits the number of some of these. Like, oh, and Class C is just a wine license. It's primarily used at, at restaurants and typically is issued just like the cider license uh, with, uh, uh, with beer licenses. The, the quota, there is a state quota that applies to the Class B liquor licenses. So there is a limited number of licenses. In fact, that quota is full. We don't have any available licenses, although as license, we're currently in the main licensing period and uh, on July 1, uh, typically on July 1 of each year, we find out maybe there is a, a licensee that, ha that has not renewed and there might be one or two available. There, is also, there are also reserve licenses. Uh, in many communities, reserve licenses are also filled up. In Sheboygan, for whatever reason, people don't tend to buy the reserve licenses. There's very few of them, and so we have plenty of them available. Um, the main issue is that they're more expensive. They're, they're $10,000. Uh, we used to have a, a program where, in essence, we provide a community development grant uh, to uh, people who obtain those reserve licenses uh, that would basically cover the cost above and beyond a normal license, but um, that the legislature took the ability of us to do that away a number of years ago. So. Those, those licenses are a little bit more restricted in some other ways too. They're a little harder to transfer. Uh, one of the issues around the quota is that you will often, uh, when, when there becomes a license available, you'll often have multiple applicants who are interested in that license. And so the policy of the city has been not to do things on a first come first serve basis, but rather to schedule at this hearing an opportunity for anyone who's interested in an available license to come make a presentation to you. Um, and in, as part of that presentation, then you make a determination as to who you're going to allow to apply for that available license. They still have to go through the application process, uh, uh, but you're making a decision as to who's going to be able to do that. And there's you know, different uh, different things that you can consider in that. We'll get to some of the, the policies a little bit later on. We also do have uh, a city imposed quota on class A liquor licenses, basically the liquor store licenses. Uh, we did increase it a few years ago, uh, but it is our, it's, it's been imposed by, it's been self-imposed by the common council so that we don't have liquor stores on every corner, uh, but you are able to change that if you feel to do so. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when a license is denied or suspended. Uh, so there's a couple of different uh, situations in which that may happen. Uh, first, new applicants. New applicants who, who are not renewing a license um, have the fewest rights under, under the system that we have in the state of Wisconsin. They can be denied for any legal reason so long as the applicant has a chance to have the app application reviewed and there's a rational basis for denial and it's not otherwise in violation of the law. Um, so uh, typically what we've said is that is at this stage when people are applying for a license for the first time that you, uh, first of all, the clerk takes the closest look at them, but also you should take the closest look at those things uh, because once you've issued it, it's much harder to either not renew it at a later date or to uh, suspend or revoke uh, that license. Renewals, so once they've had the license, you can only deny them a license for very specific statutory reasons, and there's a much more specific process 
uh, in how you go about. You have to send a notice of non-renewal. There are time frames, uh, those, those kinds of things. Uh, similarly, suspensions or revocations can only be done for very specific statutory reasons. It requires a hearing first. So uh, those things uh, will always uh, come to you uh, for a hearing. Typically, the, the staff that meets on the Mondays before LHPS, where there are issues with a tavern or with a, a bartender where um, there is a concern that may lead to a recommendation of suspension or revocation, we will try to work with those people and hold an informal discussion and maybe offer them some options. Uh, com commonly, there are uh, the, there's the option of a voluntary surrender, whether it's for a period of time or, or uh, permanently. But then if they choose not to go through that voluntary process, which most of them do, um, but not all of them, then we have to set a hearing. Uh, there is also a provision uh, where citizens can also file complaints themselves. Uh, that's fairly rare. Uh, most of the time these are coming primarily through uh, 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 the police department, but occasionally from some other departments as well. Uh, and, the, and then the city is filing them. Um, and then we typically will hire outside counsel to uh, handle some portion of, of those um, matters so that we don't have a conflict between my office representing the committee or the, the clerk and uh, and if, especially if there might be two different views of that. I did attach at the end, there's a guide for suspension revocation hearings. Um, these are, so that guide just kind of, it's especially good for the chair to have, so that if we ever do have a hearing for a suspension or a revocation of a license, uh, that, that gives you a little bit of a script of how, how we do that. I also did attach uh, uh, statutes at the end of the outline that hopefully can help you understand a little bit um, one, of, one of the things I think that's important there, and so I sort of reiterated it, is this issue around what is, uh, what is a violation that's related to the licensed activity. And so and this, this is actually a quote from a, a court case that, that interprets that. And it says there, it's not the details of the criminal activity that are important, but rather the circumstances that foster criminal activity, such as opportunity for criminal behavior, reaction to responsibility, and character traits of the person. So those are the kinds of things that you're considering uh, when, when you decide uh, whether you're going to consider um, whether or not to, to grant a license. And specifically, if there are violations of, of these statutes, that's what you're looking at, rather than just simply um, the details of, of the, the, the criminal act. Uh, if you determine that you consider these factors and, and a person's convictions substantially relate to their license activity, you can deny uh, or you can revoke, suspend, etc. If not, then you would not deny, revoke, suspend, etc. One of the things that's important too about these, these hearings is that you are sitting in a quasi-judicial function, meaning you're sitting like judges when you make this decision. That's a little bit different than your, how you normally act, right? You're legislators normally, right? You're, uh, and, and as legislators, you're advocating for people in, 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 in your aldermanic district or you're, uh, you know, you're passing legislation. But when you're asked to sit in your quasi-judicial function, you need to be, um, you need to have no conflicts. You need to be uh, fair and balanced. And so for that reason, we don't provide you a lot of information about these hearings until they actually happen. Um, and you should not be like investigating these things ahead of time on your own. You shouldn't be taking calls from people on matters that are going to be coming in front of you because you actually have to consider the evidence that's brought in front of you at these hearings. We actually did. It's been, it's been a while now. It was probably 10 years ago. We actually had to delay, uh, a quasi-judicial hearing until the new council year because all five members of the LHPS committee admitted that they, they were not fair and, and balanced on a particular issue. Um, in some cases, because they'd investigated it. In some cases, because they were regular patrons of that place and didn't feel comfortable making that decision. And so we had to hold off uh, so, that, so that we could actually hold that hearing. I talked a little bit about the quota issues. Uh, I don't think I'm going to add anything more to what I've already said, but that's there uh, for you. Uh, 
Um, there are some policies on licenses as well for your review. We'll get to that in the next thing, uh, but that's also uh, that's also been attached, and I'll talk about those when we get to item number seven. Uh, next uh, type of uh, license that we're talking about is taxicab licenses, and we have uh, three different kinds of taxicab licenses: <laughs> driver licenses, vehicle licenses, and equipment licenses. Driver, obviously, are the people who drive the cabs. Vehicles are actually you know, licenses that are fixed to the specific vehicle to make sure that it's safe, and then the business licenses are for the business. Uh, denying suspending licenses is, is here, it's really the rational reason standard for taxi cab licenses. Um, there does, again, need to be a connection of the business of taxi cabs if the license has already been issued. Um, however, if the person already has a license, uh, they'll, they'll have that right to a hearing. So it, similar to the liquor area, uh, you have your greatest ability to deny where it's a new application. Once you've applied, it's more limited because the, the people do have do obtain a somewhat of a property right into those licenses. And so you have a higher standard to, to suspend than you do to deny. There are some other licenses uh, uh, that, that we may end up talking about. Most of these are clerk decisions, um, but occasionally you may get something brought back to you uh, on, on a hearing. So I, I won't get a lot into all that. Uh, some of the things that you will still see because the, the actual um, liquor licenses, the, the you know, class A, class B, those those will still come to you on, on the report of officer. You probably saw a fairly uh, a large report of officer. It'll be even larger uh, in two weeks. Um, those, those come to you. Changes of premises, changes of agents, those all still come to you. The clerk doesn't have the ability to do that on, on her own. Open and closed sessions. Uh, I kept this in here. We don't, we don't go into closed session very much in this, uh, in this committee. There was a time when this committee would regularly ask to go into closed session um, regarding uh, liquor licensing issues. And you're allowed to do that if you're deliberating about a hearing. Uh, you're not allowed to do that just to like, oh, uh, this person feels embarrassed and to talk about their thing in, in open session. Can we please go into closed session? That violates uh, public meetings law. So uh, that occasionally has been an issue, uh, although I think more recently people understand that um, and uh, we haven't had too many issues with that in, in recent years. A couple other things to, to think about. I mentioned the last paragraph there under six is, is that quasi-judicial role. Uh, it can be difficult to, to balance your quasi-judicial role with the, the rest of you know, your typical legislative or advocacy role uh, that you're more familiar with. Um, back in the day when we used to have two alders per district, the way it was, there was sort of an easier way to handle this, which was we typically did not appoint both people from a district to this, to this committee. And so if there was someone being called into this committee, the alder who was on the committee would just not deal with the issue except for at the committee, but they would inform, you know, if they were getting calls, they'd inform them, go talk to your alder for this other district. We don't have that system anymore, uh, although, you know, certainly there's nothing that prevents you from referring them to one of your colleagues who's not on this committee, maybe, you know, nearby or maybe the person who, represents the district they live in rather than where their bar is, things like that. Um, because there, there, there still is, it's still appropriate for those who are not on this committee. Uh, you know, the, the, there is an advocacy role for you uh, in that regard to help your, uh, help your constituents out. Um, I can answer any questions that you may have, but uh, those are, that's my presentation. I don't know, I think the clerk and the PD may have a few things to add, but, um, any questions? I have one question. I know we have a quorum. We have an even number of alders. What if we have a split vote? How is that handled? So a tie vote defeats the matter. Often what this committee does when you get a tie vote or historically what you've done, it, because a lot of these things are about making recommendations about license applications, that kind of thing. In those situations, often what happens is it gets referred to council without a recommendation rather than just a, a, if you can't if you can't get three votes for or a, you know a majority vote number of votes for either a denial or 
a grant of the license that it's typically gone to council without a recommendation. Uh, there are other ways you can do it too. You can hold it two weeks. That's happened before too, where um, you know somebody couldn't make it and uh, they held it so that that person could hear the matter. Any other questions? Yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, thank you. The reserve license, mm -hmm. are those available for any type of license? Any so the reserve license are for liquor licenses. These are for class uh, Class B liquor licenses, the retail. Only, only class B? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay, only class B. In essence, it's it's it, they're because of the quota. They are Class B licenses. It's just they're a class of Class B licenses. And they are not subject to a quota. So if you have the thousand dollars, they are they are subject to a quota as well. Oh, okay. So what happened is probably about twenty five years ago, um, the 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 state. Yeah. Well, the ta the tavern league. Let, let's, let's let's be straight about it. The tavern league has has a lot of legislative pull. And um, the concern was there is a benefit to the current tavern owners to limit the number of licenses, right? And so they were able to get the legislature to pass a rule that basically said, okay, that old quota that you used to have, we're going to freeze how many licenses you've actually issued today. And that's the regular licenses. And the, the ones that are still sitting there that are available, those are the reserve licenses, okay? So that's where our numbers come from. Now they do get adjusted. Uh, if, if the city were to grow in size, um, we, we, we would potentially uh, get new licenses. Uh, additionally, we, like we've, we've annexed um, licensed, uh, um, we've annexed uh, portions of towns that have licensed facilities in them that gets added. You, you, they don't like lose their ability to run their business simply because we annexed them. So that increases our number as well. So our number is actually higher than it was uh, 20 years ago. Not, not a ton higher, but it is higher because of that. Yep. And as of today, the, both types of quota are maximized. No, we have plenty of reserve licenses. Reserve. Uh, for the reserve quota. The reserve okay. license. We okay. have plenty of those. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We okay. just we have no regular licenses available. Any other questions? I have one more question. Go for it. And I don't know if it is uh, maybe in, uh, in the document. Anyway, the temporary alcohol licenses, for example, for events and so on, is something that is left by the clerk only. And how do they are they obtained? Yeah, so that's also, we do review them in that committee, uh, but so we, we often call those picnic licenses. They're a, they're a specific kind of license. Uh, it's limited who's able to get them. You have to be a bona fide club, nonprofit, you know, it's actually not even a nonprofit, but a bona fide club, uh, you know, there's, it's very limited who can get it. Not a regular business mm -hmm. can't get those. Um, and that's why oftentimes what you'll see is when there's an event, like a picnic type event, it's often sponsored by an organization because they're the ones who are getting that license. As of today, however, if, if an organization wants to acquire one of those licenses for their fundraising events on a regular basis, let's say twice, three times a year, are they eligible and who is actually eligible? Yeah. But if I find the information here, that is fine. Yeah, yeah. The, the, so organizations that are, they have to be that bona fide club or yeah. organization. But as long as long as they are, they're eligible for if it's just beer, they're eligible for as many as they want. You just have to pay for them each time. Um, wine and liquor, we limit the, the state limits how many of those you can get in a given year. Do you remember, Meredith, how many it is? Two to a, a year. It's just wine. Yeah. Oh, and it's just wine. It's not liquor. That's right. There's no liquor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So the wine ones are much more limited. Okay. Thank you. The common, the common ones we see, I, I mean, they're like churches, church picnics and things like that. A lot of them, they're only doing beer, so they'll, they'll get six, ten of them. Yeah. The Arts Association typically gets a bunch of beer only, but then, and then they'll get two a year for their, uh, for wine. Very good. Thank you. All righty. That, uh, city clerk's office. Do you have a presentation? All right. And please. Nope. All right. Perfect. Then 
go to item number seven, adoption of the policies and procedures of the licensing, hearings, and public safety committee. So these are policies that uh, have been carried over from year to year. Uh, they start on page 17. Uh, so on page 17, there are guidelines to be used for granting and denial of liquor licenses. And uh, so these are, uh, we always provide these to you when um, you're getting those uh, presentations made to you for available liquor licenses, because these are the guidelines that you can use. And this was drafted primarily so that you knew what you could consider and what you couldn't consider. It's not like we said, we're not gonna consider these valid things, but it's, it's basically to give you examples of things that, that you can and should uh, consider. Um, and I'll let you look through those things, but primarily it's about making sure that this will be a, a good business that fits in the neighborhood and, and you know, will have a good impact uh, on the city. But it also it ensures that you're not using improper, you know, you, you can't be deciding, oh, I don't like this person because of their race, gender, religion, things like that, obviously. But even just like, oh, we have too many of this kind of bar in the town. No, that, that's really not the issue. The issue is, are they adding, are they having a positive impact on the surrounding neighborhood? Are they having a positive impact on the economics of the city? Uh, or are they having a negative impact? And, and so that's really the issue, not that we have too many this kind of place or whatever. The second one is the policy statement on issuance of original Class A liquor licenses. This is the retail liquor licenses. And uh, it tells you, first of all, that there's the, 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 our own uh, quota, which is 15, which is in, you know, it's actually in 10-102 of the old municipal code. I forgot to update that for the, the new recodification. I'll do that next time. Uh, but it's the same, the, or, the ordinance is the same. It's just not 10-102. Uh, then we do have, we have this policy, it's, it's, uh, it does say that if you're issuing a Class A liquor license um, to businesses other than stores that exclusively sell liquor, so like to grocery stores or, or uh, convenience stores and things like that where it's liquor, there are some requirements uh, that, that, that you've uh, placed or you know, people on this committee have placed before. One is a separate segregated interior space for the display of the intoxicating liquor that limits access and provides one entrance and exit. A gate that can shut it off uh, between 9 p.m. And, and 8 a.m. when you can't have them. A separate uh, register or checkout for the intoxicating liquor area. Uh, and, and then in making sure that the layout complies with code, uh, code requirements. Uh, the committee did, uh, in a number of years ago, um, broadened this somewhat, and that's what, what you'll see there. Um, it used to be that you couldn't sell at all outside of that liquor store area. We do now allow that while you have to have the separate liquor area, a customer can purchase intoxicating liquor at a register in another part of the store as long as all of uh, all the requirements are. So you can now go to Meyer, at, you know, you could check it out in the liquor store or you could check it out at the, at the regular <coughs> That according to their policy, but they do. Meyer just can't put liquor outside of their liquor store area or festival or whoever. Um, and then there are other conditions that you could impose uh, if you feel like uh, it's it's necessary. So that gives you a little bit of clarity. And finally, it is the policy not to issue Class A liquor licenses to uh, convenience stores or mini marts that also sell gas or other motor fuel. Basically, the idea being is if they're a gas station, we're going to limit them to, to beer and not to liquor. Uh, finally, uh, this is the last policy on, on page 21 is the, the policy regarding treatment of life. This is a little more of a broad policy that basically gives some guidance to uh, the committee that assists the clerk in deciding uh, how to handle uh, licenses and, and some of it is just the, the process uh, that I've described to you already. Uh, but in section four, you have some guidelines. They're not, um, they're not absolutely firm guidelines that, that you, you've given um, the clerk and, and those advising the clerk some ability to go outside of those in special circumstances. But typically there's some guidelines as if there's 
violations, what will happen, uh, you know, how their license will be suspended and what will be requested of them. Um, and, you know, so that's, and, and it, 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 we do look back during a, a 12 month period for that. So those are the policies. Um, a motion would be if, if you so desire to um, adopt uh, those policies and proceed. Any questions on those? All right. Seeing none, uh, looking for a motion. I make a motion to approve. I'll second. Or recommend. Approve? Yeah. yeah. Approve. I'll second. All, right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Those opposed, ayes have it. As approved. Item number eight, RO number 135-23-24 by Fire Chief Eric Montalano. Mont I can't say that right. You're wrong. <laughs> Montalano, pursuant to section 24-459 of the Municipal Code, submitting the quarterly report showing the benchmark measurements for the fire department for the period commencing January 1st, 2024 and ending March 31st, 2024. Thank you, Chair. So um, yeah, you should have all the information. Just a few of the highlights, I'll, I'll make it quick since this is a long meeting. Uh, our volume is uh, about 157 calls higher than last year, which is obviously the trend, it ebbs and flows. Uh, one thing to note of all those calls um, are overlapping incidents have increased tremendously, we're 57% higher. So what that means is anytime one call goes out, we're potentially getting another call at the same time or five calls at the same time. It's just uh, the city's getting busier and busier. It's just the way it is. Um, our, our fire inspections, I wanted to point something out. Uh, last year we had uh, about 900, a little over 980, 980 call uh, inspections in that quarter this year we're only at 24 because we had a couple light duty individuals last year that mm. I mean, they were hitting them uh constantly so there is a do, uh, noticeable difference when you don't have that not that i'm wanting light duty personnel uh but uh yeah so we're, we're only at 25 this year or in this quarter so uh big difference but i'll be glad to answer any questions if you have any any questions Um, so here there is the year to date 2023 and year to date 2024, right? Mm -hmm. Which makes sense because then we can compare mm -hmm. apples to apples to apples. However, uh, under the fire loss, there is such a huge difference between year to date. How is that possible? All the items there are amazingly different. Because uh, so what you're looking at when you look at the fire loss, the the, the incident, the pre-incident value versus what the property loss has been. It all depends on what's burning, right? Um, so you'll you'll even notice uh, in 2024, we had 18 year-to-date fires, um, six in 2023. But if you go down to the investigations on the, in the next column, uh, the next section, there's 18 investigations. Last year, there was nine investigations versus six fires. So it's the category of how it, according to our state and federal guidelines, what we have to categorize things as. So the pre-incident value, that's why there's a huge difference. It just depends on what's on fire. We, we can't control that. So that's why the, the loss is. And they're estimates. It's our firefighters going to like estimating what this building would be worth. Yeah. It's not an exact science. But. I get it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. But also I was wondering um, about the 57% that overlapping that you mentioned, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I. Is there any, any other reason that you can think of as the population didn't change? No, so it's it's the age of the population. It's the number of businesses in the city. You know, again, as you grow, uh, as there's more build or on the opposite end, less build, more um, dilapidated structures, that kind of stuff. Um, that causes some some overlapping is it but it's really our age of our our population you know you're getting more ambulance calls that's that's truly where our multiple calls come in is by ems not always i mean you could have two fires back to back but it it's just rare 
it's more EMS related. So when you're out in one call, you get five or six ambulance calls and that's what happens a lot of the times. Um, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. It would be interesting to see, uh, just one yeah. more comment on that, the, the trend line in the last few years, because it makes sense what you are saying. However, 57% increase from one year to the other it doesn't make much sense. I mean, I understand the age population and everything, but the aging issue, but from one year to the other, it seems a little bit, it doesn't just stats wise doesn't make much sense to me. So it would be nice to see if there is a trend, you know, just as a curiosity to see how uh, how we are doing on that. Yeah, uh, in our annual report, there's uh, a graph that shows the last five years and mm -hmm. the increase. Yeah. yeah. Um, the only thing, I, honestly, uh, Alder Perella, I that I, I don't have the numbers for you or the facts is whether it's the EMS related or if they're because you're on a structure fire, we get two other ambulance calls. You know. I, it's, it's very difficult to break that down, but I could look at that okay. and see if I can come up with something. Sure thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Laura Pearson, did you have No, she asked my All question. Right. All right. Any others? Okay. I'm looking for a motion to file. I make a motion to file. Second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That's filed. Uh, item number nine. RO number 134-23-24 by Police Chief Christopher Domagowski, pursuant to Section 30-50 of the Municipal Code, submitting the quarterly report for the Police Department for the Freedom Unit, commencing January 1st, 2024, and ending March 31st, 2024. Chief? Good evening. Um, so again, you have the report in front of you. Um, the highlights that I would share with you uh, for year to date, part one crime, there's a decrease, it's very slight. <clears throat> Um, decrease in comparison to the same period last year. 166 um, total part one crimes versus 175 last year. If you um, break it down via um, crimes against persons, it's 47 this year and 50 last year. Crimes against property, 119 this year versus 125 last year. Traffic accidents, again, were down in comparison to last year, just slightly 371 versus 375. And then there is also a decrease in involuntary commitments year to date in comparison to the same period last year, 18 versus 37. And I would point out that um, we do have a co-responder program that's ongoing. And uh, I think a lot of that has to do with um, the work that's being done there. So, any questions you have? Any questions? Yes. Other um, So, I, I, I'm pleased to see that there is nothing sticking out in particular. So, that is good news, right? I was, I'm a little bit, um, I was just wondering, there are 2,000 more parking tickets you should be seeing? Yep. I have a new lieutenant who I let the fire under, and she did an excellent job with her people, keeping them motivated and understanding why we do what we do and the importance of uh, consistency to, to all of the citizens in the city and the, you know, the fairness that that delivers when we're consistent with how we do it. So when you look at that number, it doesn't stick out like something that maybe is too much. You know, I just wonder, you know, because it's 2,000 more. I mean, it's almost 40% more than last year. It seems a little bit, I don't know. Good lieutenant who got motivated and mm -hmm. did what she's supposed to do with her people. So if you go back years, you'll see the same, same numbers. Meaning that we had, because last year is... Last year was down. Without a doubt. Oh, and okay. The year before that was down. The year okay. before that, we in the five thousands. Okay. Previous to that, we've hit six thousand a couple of years. Most right. of that is winter parking. So that and, means. And so the biggest complaints that we get, that you probably get, that the mayor's office gets, is you're writing tickets here, but you're not writing tickets there. It's not fair, or you're never hitting my street. So there's people that are violating on my street. When are you going to come get there? If you look at the hours that, that we're enforcing that, we got like about somewhere between six and four people on the street during those hours. So lots of area in the city to cover. Um, and, and during that time, it only takes one, two calls um, and there's nobody available to go write those tickets. Um, and Chief talks about overlapping calls. We have overlapping calls 24 hours a day. We have times of the day, you can ask Matt, because he works during the busiest times. 
Well, we have calls stacked, 10 calls waiting to get an answer because we don't have people to, to respond to them. And I'm not saying that that's a bad thing. We talked a lot about how we deal with that and the importance of dealing with priorities and, and, and things like that. So, so what I'm telling you say... is this is just people being motivated and understanding why they're doing what they're doing and what they're supposed to be doing and, and good supervision, making sure that in their downtime, they're busy. And just for to confirm, you were saying, if I understood correctly, that maybe for a couple of years, those numbers were down. Yep. Right? So we yep. will be able to see that trend yep. um, on, on a five or 10 year basis. In I would say annual, most of the years, yeah, they're, they were much higher. <clears throat> But over over the last two years, they were they were down quite a bit. Thank you, Alder Heideman. No, thank you, Chairman. Let's keep that person in that position. <laughs> that would be, or the next person that takes over for that person, they have the same enthusiasm because I looked at at that as a positive, yep. a very much a positive. Not that you're spending your time writing tickets, but that's one of the jobs that they have, and and now they're doing it, which is fantastic. Right, and we would prefer to write no tickets. We don't want to right. write anybody a ticket. Right. Those cops hate writing people's tickets. But if we're not, again, it's not fair to everybody. And then when it does snow, those blocks don't get cleaned up because there's cars parked. They're stopping that and preventing that from getting cleaned up. Is there a certain section of, of the city of Sheboygan that gets more tickets written than, I mean, does the north side get more than the south side? What I'm telling you is that that one of the things that we stress is to be fair. And so one of the things that we've done the last, I, I don't know, maybe three years, I want to say, is, is the, so, you know, we plot all kinds of data to look okay. at it, where accidents are happening, where crime is happening, where we're writing tickets, all of this. So our analyst has been plotting every park winter parking ticket that we do too so that the lieutenant has that tool so she can see okay are they going everywhere if they're missing a neighborhood you need to go over there tonight and do that so thank you any other questions <clears throat> comments all right looking for a motion to file i make a motion to file second all right all those in favor aye aye as filed all right Item number 10, resolution number 7-24-25, resolution authorizing the appropriate city officials to execute the intergovernmental agreement for law enforcement services for the 2024 Republican National Convention in, Rep in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, between the city of Milwaukee and the city of Sheboygan. Chief. Uh, so as you're aware, the uh, city of Milwaukee is hosting the Republican National Convention this, this year, the week of July 15th. Um, as part of that, um, the city was declared a national security special event. And as part of that, um, they've requested mutual aid from law enforcement agencies essentially across the country. They're looking for between 4,000 and 6,000 extra bodies to help them provide the security services they need. Um, so we finally got an intergovernmental agreement that spells out essentially how we get reimbursed for the resources that, that we provide. We've given that to Chuck's office. Chuck has reviewed it and approved it. And so it's before you for your approval. It's fairly similar. You approved one for the 2020 Democratic uh, uh, National Convention as well in Milwaukee. And it's, I'm not going to say it's the same, but it's similar. Okay. Any questions? Well, there are Thank you. Um, so we have this agreement so then the city of Milwaukee can call on the city of Sheboygan for any mutual help, or is it posted within the department that these officers can say, okay, I got an off day. Now I can go down there and work. Right now we're making arrangements to determine how many people we're gonna send down there. We're gonna send approximately 10. On, on our regular scheduled officers? For five days. No, no, well, most of them will be on, it will be on overtime on their off days. Um, there's some officers that are on the countywide uh, set team, which handles large crowd events. Essentially, they have special training for that. So all three of them will go whether they're working or they're off. That's what we train them for. And by sending them here, they're going to get the best training that they're going to get anywhere. So real life experience. So we want them to go. When I looked through the document, I didn't see any dollar figures as to what we're charging. 
is there a set amount that every you know so if i'm coming from another community if i'm coming from fond lac does the fond lac police department get paid the same as the sheboygan police department no there there's attachments in there um whatever attachment a and b or whatever okay. which are forms that we fill out essentially we're filling out their hourly costs their health insurance everything in there and okay so, so we're getting reimbursed what it's costing the city okay thank you mm -hmm. i was hoping we kind of make more on it but it's yeah it would be nice but the federal government <laughs> <won't allow it. laughs> that's how fire state, state government doesn't allow it either cities aren't allowed to make money all right <laughs> any other questions comments i'm just curious so uh is the Milwaukee Police Department that reaches out to the different cities. It, it makes only sense intergovernmental mm -hmm. collaboration, but how does that work? Do they ask for two different cities? In, in this case, it's, it's yeah, the City of Milwaukee Police Department that is doing this, but they're working um, with the Secret Service is, is the lead agency, obviously, because it's a national security event, but everybody's there. The FBI, the marshals, there's like about 30 different committees that all are planning out all kinds of different things. Um, I meant, I'm sorry, I wasn't clear in my question. I meant the MPD reached out to us, to our Sheboygan Police Department, but they assumed they reached out to other cities as well, right? They reached out to probably close to every police department in the, in the United States. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All righty. Looking for a motion. I move uh, approval. Second. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, that is approved. Item number 11, beverage operator license application number 4586. Carrie Schulst. 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 Yes. Re sorry. That's okay. Regar hearing regarding denial <laughs> of license. So this is one of those denial uh, hearings that, that you mentioned. This is a denial of a new license, so it's the, the, the standard. Uh, and uh, uh, Lieutenant Walsh is going to give you a little bit of information here uh, about uh, why it was. Uh... So Mr. Shulis was convicted in 1994 of delivering marijuana in Waukesha. And because of that conviction by state law, it makes him ineligible to have a license. Um, he can apply for a pardon, um, but that is not something that he does at the local level. So I would suggest that you know, Mr. Shulist is here uh, on his denial, and, and if he provides you evidence that he actually was not convicted of that charge, then, then you, should, um, uh, you should overturn the decision of the clerk. Uh, if if he doesn't, then your only option is to uphold the decision of the clerk. So he's here to speak to you to that. I'm not denying I was convicted in 1994 for delivery of two ounces of THC. Um, it was 30 years ago. I did my time, probation, fines, everything taken care of, and I have had a spotless record since then. I also have three different municipalities, state of Wisconsin, where I recent bartender's license in. I've worked for 30 years in this industry since this happened. And I'm just wondering why it's so different in Sheboygan than it is everywhere else. I just moved here four months ago. I have a opportunity to work for Harbor Lights on 4th and Pennsylvania, and I was denied. And I guess I'm, if all these other municipalities gave me that chance to work and prove myself, why won't Sheboygan? I can pass these around if people want to see. These are the three most recent town of McGuanago, village of McGuanago, and the town of Vernon. And like I said, it's just two copies, right? So, and why were these approved? He was an, an eligible, if he's ineligible. These, most of these sound like small communities in the Milwaukee area. They probably just weren't careful to, to do a full review. Um, they're actually not valid licenses. 
um, because the state law says that even if an is a license is issued, if they're not eligible for the license, and unfortunately for him, his conviction is specifically listed in the statute as one that makes you ineligible for a license, we can't issue it. Um, and so, so yeah, it's even even those licenses are not valid in those communities. They they made a mistake. Um, he what he needs to do. I, I mean, frankly, I think this com the committee would like to issue this license. Um, he's the type of person that should get a license. We're just prevented to by the state statute. He should go get that pardon and do it now while we have a governor that issues pardons. Um, it I I just. I, I understand these are smaller communities, but I went in front of their common council and had to prove myself to them as well. I'm sure they know the state law, state statute. Otherwise, they wouldn't have a committee to review those types of licenses or requests. Um, in 30 years of bartending, I've never had a violation on my bartending record ever. I've never served a minor, never been ticketed, cited for anything. I've always maintained a very well-run shift. I don't have fights during my shifts. I don't overserve people. I've been doing this a long time. This is my livelihood. And I'm asking for you guys to let me continue to do my livelihood. This is the way I make my money. So I understand that statue also does say for repeat offenders. I'm not a repeat offender. Only it doesn't say that specific to this it, violation. It, oh, I, I actually provided them a copy of the statute. Um, Is the statute in the, in the documentation? Yeah, in the documentation, it's 111 335. H. H. It, it also says in there about alcohol related offenses. This is not an alcohol related offense. This did not take place at a bar. Um, it has nothing to do with my job. The, the relevant statute is sub CS. So sub CS is notwithstanding 111.322, which is the one that, that says uh, that says it has to be related to the license activity. It is not employment discrimination because of conviction record to revoke, suspend, refuse to renew a license or a permit under chapter 125 if the person holding or applying the license or permit has been convicted of one or more of the following. And those are the five convictions. Because the because of that, anyone with a conviction for those five licenses becomes ineligible under 125.04.5b, which says you can't be convicted if you have a criminal record. Um, so those two statutes working together, there's he, he's going to have to get pardoned, unfortunately. But this is only the city of Sheboygan that's denying me. I have had a license for 30 years in the state of Wisconsin, the same state that we're all living in right now. How can Sheboygan be different from every other? It's the same law throughout the state. It's a state law. I understand it, but how have I been able to bartend? So then these other communities that have issued me a license, they technically broke the law. Right. Are you going to go after them? Because I got charged for breaking the law and I had to do my time. Are you going to go after these municipalities and charge them with issuing licenses that aren't valid? So you're telling me, I've been bartending as a fraud for 30 years in the state of Wisconsin. Yeah. And I, I just don't see how that's happening. I just have a question. It has a state stamp on my license. So the, the definition of a controlled substance, I assume obviously that the marijuana is under it, but the, yes. the amount. Two, two ounces. The amount does is. Does not make any difference in this case. Right. The issue is not the amount. The issue is that rather than possession, it's possession with intent to distribute, deliver, manufacture, et cetera. That's, that's the issue. So the amount does matter. The amount is what it really Any other questions, comments? Uh, Mr. Schulitz, yes. I, I think that our hands are tied here. I, I just, I guess I don't understand how when I've already proved that I've worked in the state of Wisconsin. It's, doing not, this. it's not a matter of proving that you've worked here. It's more, we're a bigger community than all those places. And we're under more of a microscope than say, McGuanago is. I, I, I guess the other, yeah, thank you. I guess the, 
I'd love to see you have a license. I have no problem. I think 30 years of, of being free or uh, free from doing that and everything, that's a positive. And I, I think you you would be a, uh, somebody that we want to have in our community. Uh, the problem I have is if we do this for you, who's the next person that comes up that says, well, you gave him the license. I've been working for five years, but they didn't have a license, but they were they were uh, basically being in a tavern where somebody was watching over them. You know, that that's the problem you have with, with going against what we're required to do is we open that door up for other people that, quite honestly, aren't as good as you. Okay, so basically I'm going to pay the rest of my life and never be able to better myself and work because of this felony. It, it, it doesn't make sense. People deserve another chance. I've proven that so, I haven't done anything in 30 sure. years. Nobody's disagreeing with you. And we've reiterated we would love to have you here. But the problem is is not it's the statute. Yeah, I would I would recommend as crappy as this sounds, excuse my language, you have to talk to a legislator or you have to talk to right contact the governor's office. Yeah, contact okay. the governor's office. We've had other people in your circumstance. I understand that, I but guess that's, it's not that's immediate. Me. It, it takes a little bit of time. Uh, but you are, I think you're the poster boy for the person who should get a pardon. Um, and since we currently have a governor that's issuing pardons, I would get on there. I, I, frankly, if if if, uh, if I were you, I'd get on there even if you didn't want to uh, do this because I agree with you that 30 years ago, two grams of marijuana shouldn't be a basis for it. It's the law that, that is saying this, not us. We would love to grant you this law. Okay, then my next question would be, I paid $57 for to pay for a bartender's license. I was denied. And when I talked to attorney Adams on the phone, he had mentioned that it's an application fee, but yet it's really not because it's a two-year license fee. So me being denied that, I should be refunded my money. It's an issue for the clerk, not for the committee. To say. Well, but if it's a policy, that's why I brought it up. Well, I would, yeah, I would reach out to the clerk's office. Okay. Could I please get that paperwork back? Yes, sir. You got all of it? Oh, okay. I got it. So, all right. So we still stand tonight. Yes. You should make a motion okay. to uphold the decision of the court. Looking for a motion. I um, make a motion to uphold the decision of the court. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Sorry, Mr. Schultz. Um, Me too. Yeah. Please do get that. Work, work on getting that pardon. So but once he gets that, do we have to come back through this or can we just yeah. go straight to the so, so that's one of the things I talked to Mr. Shulist about. Okay. It's probably, it's not going to happen real quickly. I get it. But you can hold, you know, he could have held the, the application open. Um, but instead of doing that, he chose to appeal. And so it's been denied. So it'll be a new application. But as soon as he gets pardoned, yeah, make that application and... But you, do we, it, so once the, you, you won't come in front of the committee, apply. you won't even have to come in front right, of the committee. Right, that's what I'm asking. Yeah, okay. Because the, yeah. our, the staff well, committee has yep. already recommended to the clerk that if, if this, there's a pardon, sure. that the, issue, the license be issued. There's, there's really no, okay. the only reason is the statute. Right. It's not. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I am number 12. The beverage operator's license application number 4320, Jessica Bamard Kinch, hearing regarding denial. This is also a hearing regarding a denial of a new application for a license after staff recommended denial because of her uh, record of violations related to the license activity, history of non cooperation with the police, and a pending charge related to the license activity. and. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Lieutenant Walsh to present the reasons why uh, the denial was recommended. This is not, unlike Mr. Shulist's case, this isn't one where it's just a statute says. Yeah. So what I'll do is I'm going to work in chronological order going from the most recent incident that we considered um, to the most uh, furthest away in time. And we're talking about this year back to 2017. 
Uh, the first one was March 25th of this year. Jessica was at the hospital here in Sheboygan, uh, Aurora, um, and was told that she was going to be arrested. Um, a police officer from Sheboygan Falls instructed her to turn around and put her hands behind her back. She said no. Um, the officer told Jessica to, that he was going to put her in handcuffs, and she said no. The officer then said, you are not being cooperative, turn around. He approached Jessica and she told him to tase her. He told her he was not going to do that. Uh, there was a, a, a little bit of a physical confrontation um, and the situation was stabilized and she was arrested. Um, she was arrested for um, resisting arrest. That charge is pending. Um, Jessica, um may speak about this her attorney will probably advise her that she should be careful about that because of her fifth amendment rights uh, and you by the way when you consider that you should consider that she does have the right not to mm -hmm. incriminate herself mm -hmm. the next incident is january 9th of this year it occurred in the city of plymouth um, Plymouth Police Department received a report of a male and a female fighting in the street in front of 120 Caroline Street. Not exactly sure where that is, but I think it's near the Cozy Bar because an officer found two men and a woman, one of which was Jessica, that um, had uh, been in the area. Um, there had been an altercation. Uh, Jeremy, who I believe is here, had some blood on his cheek and a scratch. Jessica was present. Looks like they had also been at the Brown Bottle and at the Plymouth Tap. They were. They told the officers that they were racing on foot home towards Elizabeth Street and that Jeremy was winning the race, so Jessica took him down and they wrestled for fun. Uh, Jeremy denied being in a physical fight with Jessica. The fight, or whatever it was, split up before law enforcement got there. There were no arrests made. The next incident occurred in the city of Sheboygan on January 14th of 2023. Officer George Rassavong responded to the quick trip at North Avenue and Calumet for a female that was passed out in her vehicle. The vehicle wasn't running, the keys were not in it. Jessica was the driver. Um, she stated she'd left a friend's house from a few blocks away and realized she shouldn't be driving, so she stopped. The officer noted the car was not on, the keys were not in it, the keys were not in the ignition. Jessica admitted to having some drinks before pulling into the quick trip to call a friend to pick her up and use the bathroom. In all fairness, the officer noted that due to Jessica's honesty, uh, he allowed Jessica to contact a friend who arrived a few minutes later. The last incident was in 2017. It occurred in Brown County. So the information that I have is not as detailed as what I've provided to you. Um, Jessica was arrested uh, in Brown County in 2017, and there was a finding in court of guilty but not guilty due to mental disease defect for two counts, two felony counts of throw slash discharge bodily fluid at a public safety worker or prosecutor. This was read in to a felony count of battery or threat to judge, prosecutor, or law enforcement officer and a misdemeanor resistance. So the committee had recommended denial due to this pattern of alcohol and of non-cooperation with police. We think that as licensed bartenders and license holders that we want our, our staff that are working in our local taverns and establishments to be cooperative with the police. Now I would suggest that you give Ms. Bombard-Kinch and or her attorney an opportunity to say what they need to say. All right. 
just to give some background, I've known Jess for 10 years. And just so you don't think I'm some hired gun or something like that. I'm the municipal prosecutor for the city of Two Rivers. November will be 19 years. I'm the municipal prosecutor for the city of Manitowoc. And I've been a special prosecutor for the Manitowoc DA's office from 03 to 2006. Um, I was involved or I, with most of these incidents. Jessica suffers from mental health issues and she has for a long time um, due to things that happened when she was young, um, certain forceful or aggressive things can trigger her. Um, I've been there when she's had a mental health crisis and police came and there was no problem. They were great. They knew how to deal with the situation and there was no issue. Um, the important part of here is it has to substantially relate to her activity as a bartender. Um, she's held four different bartending licenses since 2014. She's never had an underage drinking where she served somebody underage. She's never had any citations related to her bartending. And obviously being a bartender, there has been police involvement with patrons getting in, into things. She's been cooperative. She's filled out statements. She's done everything she's supposed to with her bartending license. And she's also been a manager. And I know she's kept her employees in line and made sure they did not violate any of the laws either. Um, I've seen the mental toll that not having her license is having on her. Um, she's got a degree in culinary arts. This is what she chose as her profession to run restaurants and be managers. She's unable right now to pay her bills or take care of her son without this license. As far as, like I said, I've seen her in the restaurants and in the bars. Everybody loves her. She does her job. The employees are kept in line and she does what she's supposed to as a bartender. To punish her for her mental health issues when she's seeking out help, I think would be a disservice and not something Sheboygan want to be known for to discourage people from getting mental health and part of mental health crises is, is they're not in control at that moment. That's why the Brown County case was not guilty by reason of mental defect. She's not, she does not have a felony conviction because it was mental defect. Okay. But as far as it has to substantially relate to her bartending license and none of the things she's ever done do that. That's true. And the Brown County thing did not cause her to lose her bartending license in De Pere. It did not affect it at all. They were aware of it. I do have two letters, one from Jess's ex-wife as a character statement. Um, we only have one copy, unfortunately. And we also have one from... Uh, Chippewa County Sheriff's Office. Yeah. Um, I can read some of it if you would like. I said, I'm a character witness. I, I know Jess to be a good person and I know the mental health issues she's dealing with and has for her entire life. She has her counselor here. She always goes to seek help. It's just that moment of crisis where it's an issue, but it's never affected her job. So. Um, I will empathetically just annotate some of the life challenges that I've been facing as of the last five years. And why the increase of my use of alcohol has happened. I seek therapy for that. And I'm honest and accountable for it too. And I try to be as safe as possible. Both of my parents were meth addicts. The fact that I'm here and not homeless and on the streets is a miracle and an inspiration. I work very hard at my mental health and I'm an empathetic person. I care for my community and I make a positive impact no matter where I work, for sure. When people walk through the door, I say, hey, how are you? And I hug them. I know their names. I know what they like to drink and I know what they like to eat. And I try to make a positive impact in everything that I do. I am imperfect and I am human. I've been going through divorce. I've been, I had to fight an unprecedented adoption case for my son that I had with my wife before we could get a divorce so that her parental rights were, were secured. I have two older children who face severe mental health issues that I've had to get wraparound services for. And for sure, I felt hopeless in my life, for sure. But feelings are fleeting, for sure. And I've learned how to manage them. 
My friend Chris Hunick has been working with me for 15 years. I've had two courses of dialectical behavior therapy. I sat on the board for a nonprofit called The Gathering Place in Green Bay for mental health. I have taken the training for a certified peer specialist. I've called a Uplift Wisconsin in times of need so I don't trouble the police. I don't place blame on the police officers that were not properly trained to handle a mental health crisis and was unaware of my PTSD. I took accountability for that. I always do. And I've never, ever had a crisis situation while I was working, not ever, because I make sure that the first thing that I, that I care about is the people that are around me. I am passionate about what I do, and I understand that my license was called to question, including because I applied at Slice Metallism, and I understand the reputation there. But I promise you, I don't do drugs. I don't allow it around me, and I don't want it in my place of business either. And I can help turn that place around and make it more money and decrease costs and positively impact the community and the economy in Sheboygan, for sure. I'm smart, and I work hard. I show up. I'm caring, I'm kind, and I'm good for the job that I do. And there are numerous other counts, sir, of me positively cooperating with the police employment. I went, I was gonna stop down there and talk to Officer Matthew Starkey because I've, I've worked with them. I've written statements. I was just a victim witness for a case with a man that has a lot of mental health issues. And I didn't wanna press charges on that man, but I had to protect the property for which I was managing. And I told the district attorney, the assistant district attorney, the victim witness office, and his, his people that were protecting him, his lawyers. That man didn't need to be punitized. He needed support. And all of us just need a little support. I'm accountable. And I change my behavior. And I work hard. And I promise you, I will do a much better job at Sly's Mid Down Saloon than David Sly or Janet Sly. I promise you that and I can turn it around for sure. And the goal is to purchase that place. And if I can't purchase that place, I really would like to purchase 902 on the Avenue or Brens. And I have investors and I promise you, you won't ever get a trouble out of me. I promise you that. Sheboygan police officers were some of the best in mental health crisis. I've called you for help before, a long time ago when I used to cut myself. I don't do that no more because, because of her. And you guys showed up and you kept me calm and you didn't escalate the situation and you made sure I was safe. I know I've had interaction with you. I know I've had interaction with that fellow too because I hit my head at Brennan's and busted it open on a radiator and needed 11 staples in my head because I'm a little klutzy too. None of us are perfect, we're all just human. And I for sure have been facing a lot of challenges, but I don't give up. And for sure, it's my inalienable right to the pursuit of prosperity and I'm fighting for that today. And I appreciate all of you listening. Thank you very much. I understand that you have a decision to make and that it necessarily isn't emotional. And I understand I got a lot of passion. in it. And I'm welcome. Any questions you got about any of the things that this officer had to say about my reputation? And if you have mental health questions, I'm here to answer that. I have a specialty in um, trauma. So I'm certified trauma. I'm also certified in DBT, which treats um, emotional disorders and distress tolerance skills, as well as, as well as interpersonal effectiveness skills. I led the DBT group, the first one in Sheboygan County, at, when I worked at Sheboygan County Health and Human Services. I've also worked up at the hospital in um, the psychiatric unit. So I know what mental health looks like and what it doesn't look like. So if you have questions for me, Jessica is amazing. I get emotional. She's an inspiration to me, given what she's been through. And can I share? You give me permission. Yes, ma'am. Okay. When she encounters men who are trying to take control, we have to understand how that affects people that have had trauma perpetrated on them in sexual and violent ways. This is why, as we said, the Sheboygan police have been operating and working at that because I was part of some of that when I worked at the county in learning how to deal with people that have had that trauma happen to them. 
and to treat it with dignity and respect. This woman has started up several restaurants and done very well, even during the COVID. So I've seen what she has done. And I've also seen her accountability with her honesty with me with drinking. But she does not do drugs and there's been drug tests and things like that. So that has not, there is some alcohol issues that she is working on. I am a substance abuse counselor licensed by the state as well. So I've led IOP groups and uh, as well. So we are working on those things to keep her in a good state. Um, I have led groups. I have done uh, alcohol assessments on, quite frankly, city officials. I've done that on police officers and they are in their jobs. Alcohol is a disease that can be treated. Depression is a disease that can be treated and so can trauma. It just takes longer with trauma. So if there's any questions. Great, any comments, questions, thoughts? Yep, over Where are you, um, thank you. Um, where are you working at? What, what, this, what place in Sheboygan are you currently at? So I'm currently employed at Slice Midtown Saloon on a I actually have not been able to work for several weeks, thank you. I've had to sell my personal property and things that I care about in order to make sure that I can live in the last two weeks. I've had my son. I don't know where I'm gonna get rent from. Sly's Midtown Saloon, when I walked in there, I didn't expect to purchase the place for sure. It's a dive, it's covered in dust, the bottles were dirty. The owner's drunk all the time, from the time he gets there till the time he leaves at noon, for sure. I don't judge. He can do whatever he wants. He's earned his right to do that. He offered me the place because he wants to retire, and I need a new business venture to get over what I just got out of. I lost everything. My whole life savings, everything I've worked for, everything in Plymouth at 52 Stafford. So I walked in. He offered me the place and a job, said I could manage there run it for him, then go on a land contract, owner financing, because I have a couple investors that are willing to put some money down. If I can get that money down, for sure I know I can, then he's out of the business and not causing havoc in the community no more. I know that they, they've had some challenges there. Let him retire and move on with his life and let the new blood take over. I will be a positive impact over there. I'd like to start a pay it forward program. It's right next to the homeless shelter and they've had challenges over there with the homeless coming in, using it for warming and such. But if you put an $8 burger and soup or burger and fries on the menu and say to any community mem member, you wanna leave an inspirational note and buy a meal for somebody, we'll hang it up on this board and they can come in during these hours for lunch, breakfast, lunch, or dinner during these hours and get a free meal from somebody in the community, well then that's a positive impact. And for sure, they could have a lot more sales because nobody's really driving business there right now. And for sure, their costs could be a lot less because nobody's watching the costs. And for sure, their bartenders need a lot more supervision. I already busted one that had one in there past 2.30 in the morning on a Friday night and held her accountable for it. So for sure, I'm the person for that job. I'm the person, that's the place I can make the most positive impact. And if I felt like it was somewhere else, I wouldn't be fighting so hard. And I sure wouldn't be all in my feelings about not being able to get a license in one city in the state of Wisconsin because I've held four in other states, bigger, I mean, other cities, excuse me, bigger than Sheboygan, held one in Green Bay, actually. Great. Any other questions? Yep. How do you think that your struggles with alcohol will be tempted with you being around alcohol all the time, and do you plan on uh, drinking while working? Of course I don't plan on drinking while working, no. sir. Of course not. She taught me what alcohol does to the brain. Can't do a good job if I'm drunk behind the bar. Really difficult to have a, hold somebody accountable without conflict if you're drinking. And I can testify that too. I had a friend that was a, that well, that is a piano player. And when she was at Chateau de Pierre, my friend would play every Friday. So I go every Friday. Never saw Jess drink when I was there. I do struggle with drinking to cope, for sure. I got a lot 
a lot on my plate, a lot of challenge that most people wouldn't take on firsthand. And for sure, I do have addiction in my genetics. I didn't choose it. It's just there. And for sure, a lot of days it's easier to just have drinks and shots when I'm done with work. But honey, work is work. That'd be like me putting a badge on and having a drink. Well, that would just be unethical. I have to manage people. I have to manage people who are also drinking. Can't do that if my brain's shut off and logic's not working because of alcohol. I can also add that as, as there are several bartenders that are in recovery, it's ironic. However, there is a piece and element to that that helps people stay clean and sober. It, it sounds strange, but it's the same concepts as when people go to things like AA and they talk about it and they experience it and they see the newcomers coming in with the shakes and everything going, ooh, you know, this is a reminder of where I don't want to be again. So it's, it, it, it can, and, and, and there are several bartenders in the area who are in the Man, man, we're not so, talking about something. We're talking well, about Jessica. I'm just saying so, that no, I'm, 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 I'm trying to answer I'm your telling, question. I know, but I'm telling you right now, we're, we're asking if we're asking Jessica a question, we're asking Jessica a question. When we ask you a question, we're asking oh, you a okay. question. Um, any other questions, comments? Yes, just in a few words. So, if I understood correctly, you're saying that you were working in bar attending, right? I owned a bar, I operated and owned a bar in Plymouth, Wisconsin called 52 Stafford on 52 Stafford Street in Plymouth, Wisconsin. How, how did you do that without a license? I had a license. Sure. I had so an agent license, license and a bartending license in Plymouth, Wisconsin. In Plymouth, yes, okay. Okay, so then I understand that it's a, it's a municipal, yeah, municipal yeah. basis. Okay, okay. Right. For how long have, did you uh, hold the, did the license, license in Plymouth again? 14, well, I currently hold a license in Plymouth, a bartending license. I no longer operate a business in Plymouth, right. but I bartended. But at that time, how long have you done? So I was an agent over a bar until it actually expires this coming summer, June 30th. So how I'm long still did an you agent. work at Stafford 52? Uh, well, I opened business October 4th, 2022, and we closed the doors December 20th, 2023 due to the lack of funding. Sorry, so then again, um, you said that you worked for 14. So before Stafford, what did you do? I was a leadership manager for Harp and Eagle for, for 10 years. So I operated a bar and restaurant called the Chateau de Pierre in De Pierre, Wisconsin. Okay. Did that for four years. I also helped him with leadership transitions as he was moving to different managers. So you were hold, sorry to interrupt, Jessica. Oh, no, I'm sorry. just going to yeah, for sure. follow my line of, yeah, of course. thoughts before I forget. So you had in the peer, you had a liquor a license, mm -hmm. right? Operator license. An agent, an agent's license okay. over an establishment. Then you you moved to Plymouth, Stafford 52, you had a license. I yes, I had a license there. I also so, and your license operator or agent license was never denied. No, I also removed, held it. Interrupted. I, no. no, I okay. apologize. I'm not trying to interrupt. I also held a license in Appleton and Green Bay. Okay. And you had never had incidents during working as a... No, okay. yes. I've always okay. been cooperative with police. Thank you. To my work. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you. We feel comfortable for a motion. Yep. So um, thank you. If you're running a bar and, and I know where Slides is and I know how many bartenders you possibly have, you still would be able to bartend because you have a, a license holder within the facility. It's not within the facility. They have to be directly supervising. That's the issue. That's probably why Sly is not letting her work because is because manager. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah, she's right. the manager. Gotcha. You do have to be directly yeah. supervising. It's just not somebody else is in the bar. So if she, if they happen to, if she got a debt supervisor, then she still would be able to run that business. She would, it would require, it would require somebody there at all times. Supervising the well, supervising. We always think that there'd be more than one bartender at Slice. Well, so the thing to think about here is that it's, it's not just that there's another bartender on premises. That's not good enough. And that's 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 why she's asking for this. Otherwise, a lot of people would probably just say, "I'll just have somebody supervise me." Right. You do it. It is actual direct 
supervision. The, the job of the person that's the supervisor is to be actively involved at all times. They're not going back to the kitchen to grab something. They're not helping another customer. So that's the problem. That's why, that's really why she's looking for this. Any other comments, questions? What, what I would say is just as you make your decision, what's important to remember, you, you make whatever decision you decide to make. What's important to remember is that when you consider the, the facts here, it's not so much, again, the facts of the offense that are, that are important, but it's, it's how they relate to um, the job that she's asking to do. It's, it's the circumstances that might foster criminal activity, such as opportunity for criminal behavior, reaction to responsibility, and character traits. Based on that, make your decision on whatever decision you want to make. Yeah, I want just to make a comment. Yep. I am torn because on one end, I think that the fact that you has you have never found um, you never had trouble while doing your job as a bar attendant, and that that is a huge historical fact to me, positive fact to me. Okay. On the other end. Uh, as an other person, I often am called to um, intervene and help with situations that bar owners and bar attendants are, uh, find themselves to deal with. And so now going back to the point of the character and the ability of dealing with the police, these facts don't speak um, as positively to them. And so I feel that as an other person, I have that responsibility to make sure that people who deal with clientele in taverns are able to deal with, uh, especially with our police officers. And so that is a, 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 the negative fact that I'm trying to weigh in into this situation. I may. I believe that Jessica has shown with her past 15 plus years of bartending experience, managerial experience, she has shown that while she is working, she is on it, on it, you know, and she can separate work from, you know, personal time. And I think that's a very important aspect too, to take into account. And she has not had, as I'm sure you guys have looked, while she's worked, she's never had a call, you know, dealing with whatever while at work. So I, I, I do yeah, I feel agree like that, that. Is a, that is a, also another character yeah. testament to her as well yeah i agree with that that the the, the history yes. of work uh in that industry speaks volumes to yes. her capability of doing so even with recent issues i had a question technical yeah. question oh, sir. Oh, sir. um i think that as you consider this if what i read you or told you about the hospital mm -hmm. had occurred in a, in a bar mm -hmm. That'd be totally different. Right. Like keep that in your mind. Right. Just to be fair. Right. And the only thing I would say to that is if it happened in a bar, was she working or was she right? You That's know, my I, point. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. 100 percent yeah. Any other Yes. yes. Uh, can the license be revoked at any time or then it j just goes through the two years process and then can be renewed? Or if, the, if, if an event occur, that can be the reasoning of uh, removal it of the can. license? So th that's the important thing we talked about at the beginning mm -hmm. is that at this point, the standard at which you decide whether to grant the license is much lower. You can deny the license for much less reasons. Once you've issued it, she gains a property right and the standard is higher. The fact that the standard is higher though doesn't mean that you can't, it's just that you can only suspend or revoke for very specific reasons and they have to be proven. And uh, there cannot be specific language to, in this case, to this motion um, that if an, that basically, if there is an event, uh, basically conditional, um, even if it doesn't exist in, in, in technical terms, a conditional license, but obviously if that happened and it comes back to this committee to decide, I would not give um, the same chance again. Mm -hmm. 
right? So in my in my book, it is conditional, but I don't know if technically speaking, there is such a thing that we can take into consideration. There's really not such a thing. We've, we have had people enter into voluntary agreements, conditioning things. So Dave's who's in, for example, um, in lieu of just simply revoking that license, because that's where it was, he agreed to an, uh, you know, a series of 15 conditions that he is going to live by in order to keep his license, but he agreed to those. You don't have the authority to impose them. Now, if Ms. Bombard Kinch were to say to you, you know, I'm willing to Im impose upon myself and have you uh, enforce it, um, a condition such as I will not drink while at work, I think that then because she's agreed to that, then you can enforce that, but that's up to her to decide whether she wants to do that. That can be difficult for the officers. Now imagine 65 yeah. or yeah. Right. 80 yeah. officers spreading the right. word. They're not all going to be able to know right. that, exactly. that, that voluntary yeah. agreement. Of course. That makes it yeah. tough. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So we have called upon deciding if denying or, or recommending or not recommending. No, uh, what is the? It's either upholding the or, decision not to uh, grant or um, or overturning the decision not to grant the license. That's your choice. I I make a motion to to um to not with, to overturn to overturn the denial. Second. All those in favor. I, Aye. all those opposed, congrats, Ms. Jessica. Thank you guys so hey, much. Hey, good luck. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Hi, how are you? Sorry, how this is you? We're not done yet, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I am number 13. Resolution. Good luck. Thank you so much. I look forward to getting to know you better yep. as I work in the district. Yeah. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you. Meredith, right on top. This just came in. Right across. Yeah, it's on oh, uh, East Street. Have there. Have you ever been there? Yeah, I've been there. <laughs> it's not that bad. Because they just uh, not I mean, I go there. When I was working third shift, I walked in there at 7 in the morning. Yeah. It's kind of scary. <laughs> I was part of the third shift. For a little bit. All right. You know, he should have asked. All right. All right. All right. I want to go home and eat. Resolution number 12-24-25, resolution authorizing the appropriate city official to complete and sign Part G of Wisconsin Department of Revenue Form AB-105 submitted by Three Sheeps Brewing. We're recommending that that uh, the clerk be authorized to sign it. Uh, there's been some back and forth about whether they actually want it or not, but if you authorize it, then if they want it, they can use it. All right, do you want it? Which, I would love it. All right, I'll, I'll make a motion. <laughs> To prove so that. Does this mean you don't Correct. So, oh, yes. so yeah, so, let's, one, let's, let's, let's give it. Let's, we need to, yeah. yeah. Whether or not he needs yeah. it, I think probably the best thing is to authorize it so okay. that, however, he's got to deal with the legalities of it. If he doesn't want us to do it, we the fact that you authorized the clerk to do it right. doesn't require her to do it. Okay. Just it yeah. authorize She her. can. Okay. Can I say one? Yes. Thing? So, while for this permit itself, the state, this whole new law is been a lot of learning for everyone and it's been a deal as well but the one thing that would be helpful by the authorization of the clerk to sign is beyond our primary permit we're allowed a secondary mobile permit and right now i would have to come before the council every time we wanted to say you know hey, there's a beer fest going on in sheboygan we get our permit we have to come before that to get the approval but if this were authorized that the use of the secondary permits were allowed then the clerk would be able to sign saying hey there is a um, like Phase Pizza is trying to put together a beer garden for one day. We can come in for four hours. We still have to get something signed by the city. Should be instead of being you, it could be. Is there. this Part G of AB 105? No, this is something else. So I'd have to. So yeah, so the committee can't deal with it today. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah. Then you'll be hearing from me again on that one later because that mm -hmm. just came out from the city yeah. a couple days ago. So I'm sorry. This is. Um, oh, can we still? Pass so it? I would I would suggest that you do pass the or recommend passage of this resolution, whether he needs it or not. Mm -hmm. He's got it. But then the other come issue will probably weeks. come back. Okay. And this is actually just to clarify, it's the mayor that signs it, not me. Oh, okay. Okay. Yes. 
so you're no, well just not. i mean it's in the resolution and it's, right. he's okay. the official of the okay. council okay. so he is the one it, it's the appropriate city official is what the resolution says oh, the yes because i was looking at the park g are we talking about the park g yes, yes. okay so can you please explain the park g to me because i looked <laughs> at it and i didn't have much understanding of it i'm just curious i mean if i have to approve it I it's, mean, it's basically it? so the, the, they're under three sheeps is under somewhat different rules than most liquor license mm -hmm. holders because they're a brewer, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, the, 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 un, under these separate rules, and there's been all these changes in the, the statute this year, um, the, the AB 105 basically is saying that we as a city approve of three sheep selling on premise, um, you know, alcohol sort of, in, you know, on, on the premise other than just simply for consumption. So that way they can sell their, you know, their product, and you know, I can go in and, you know, buy a six pack of Rebel Kent and, <laughs> and uh, um, take it home. So, so this this basically authorizes. But isn't that what you are already authorized to do that? For beer. So what this allows us to do is also then for wine and spirits. So Very good. Correct. So the li the current license does not allow for anything else, but and it's not a city license. Beer. It's not a city license. It's not a city. It's a state license. It's a state. So license. that's why he's coming to us with this form is that we are to he still gets his license through the state. Okay. But that we are proving that if you look at Part G, yeah, so I did. We're, but the, I we're the odd ducks in the city. Yes. Our state. We don't have any mm -hmm. city permit to sell our beer on property alcohol. It's all from our state permit. Okay. That's how it was structured. Now the state is just expanding on what we can do on our property from beer to also include wine and spirits. Okay. And it's a, it's just taking back what we used to have that right 11 years ago, and it's bringing that right back to the breweries. So then now, why, uh, why us now? Because the statute basically says we have to sign off saying it's okay with the city to do that. It's just like. Okay. Yeah. Making sure it's okay with everybody. Yeah. Basically. We're all on the same page. All parties. Okay. It's really funny, though. Can I say that? Because so, if we deny it, the state the, the state approved, and we deny, then what happens there? If we didn't sign this, he would still have his license. It's just that particular activity of selling liquor on the premises would be he wouldn't be able to do that. Oh. It, it's it's basically like an extension to his state permit that requires us to say, yeah, we're good with it. Well, and this form allows you to have remote places as well. Correct. That's Correct. just a different section. There's three different sections that he could have filled out that would ask for that permission as well. That's so what this form like encompasses all of that when you're going to sign part G. Somebody could have filled out just on his premise. Somebody could have filled out this remote location. And so the I city see. might say, you can only go to this one location as well and not five different ones, right? right. I mean, they could. the city could limit if he would have filled out a different section, mm -hmm. is my understanding. Correct. The bigger, the bigger one is if, <clears throat> if us having beer should wait allowed, but for whatever reason, us having spirits, let's say, wasn't allowed within 100 yards of any railroad tracks. Right. Well, then Sheboygan can say, well, you meet this definition of beer, but not spirits, so we are going to deny it. So it's almost like if there's something already written in the code that says, for some reason, where you're located or what you're doing does not meet the needs or meet the requirements to have wine and spirits. That's our, our reason to say, well, we're not going to let you do that as a city or as a brewery. Otherwise, it's more of, yes, you're meeting all the standards required by the city. So it's just this yeah. date wanting to check off, making sure that we're not doing anything untoward. In, in Your policy that you approved earlier in the meeting that talks about the sale of, of liquor mm -hmm. would mm -hmm. apply. It's just that none of the conditions in that policy that restrict it actually exist at Three Sheep. So. You can approve it. Thank you. So within his facility, though, he still has to do the guidelines where he has to have a separate area if he's selling it. Uh, is he still? No, because he's not. He's he's primarily selling alcohol. So so that 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 section does not apply to him. Okay. And so he's because he is his whole building is right. in that That's separate like area. <laughs> yeah, but then if he's bringing in wine, he's bringing in liquor. That wouldn't have to be stored in a different spot, and that no. wouldn't have. To I'm not trying to make it harder. No, please. I, this is confusing enough. That's why I wanted, it was, I'm glad to come forward so we can understand please. it. We've had plenty of officers come in asking for my permits and say, we don't have one. I think, what do you mean? So we kind of go through the whole process. And okay. It is. We're the odd ducks. It is confusing. Any other questions, comments?
Well, I'm very glad that you're going to sell wine as well. <laughs> <laughs> Already looking for a motion. I make a motion for who? What to recommend? So yeah, I'll do it. I'll second. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That's approved. I'm number 14, RO number 140. That's Thank you for your page. Thank you for your time. Yeah. By the same clerk submitting various license applications. So this, so there's two ROs today. On this one, staff is recommending granting all of the applications, no, just with the caveat that the grant of applications under license 2726, which is John Michael Fuller Arts Center, is granted contingent upon the applicant obtaining the appropriate street festival permits for the dates in question. We can pass those on to staff. Yeah, so uh, often uh, a good way to do it, the way staff used to do it, is like move to approve per staff recommendation. Okay. I make a motion to approve per um, staff recommendation. I'll second that already. Yeah. And I'd want to do that to make sure that one of fellow council members wouldn't be wondering what we're doing right. by denying yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. All righty. So all those in favor? Aye. 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 As proved. I am number 15, RO number 9 24 25 by city clerk submitting various license applications. So staff uh, is recommending granting most of the applications, but holding the change of agent application for Quick Trip 1138, that application is not yet complete. Denying the change of premise application for J&J's hotspot, it's, the, the date is passed. Granting the applications under 2085. Which is Legend Larry's contingent on the appropriate street festival permits being issued for the dates and location in question, granting a Class B liquor license renewal application to SAC Realty contingent upon receipt of the required statement of authority, and holding cigarette tobacco license applications for Vacant USA, two locations in dispensary and Speed Up Nine. Those are applications that are not yet complete. Everything else would be granted. Looking for a motion with staff recommendation. So moved. Second. All righty. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That's approved. Our next meeting it will be May 29th, 2024. Looking for a motion to adjourn. Make a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Your votes aye. We are adjourned at 617.